Hello and welcome to Go Figure, my YouTube channel where I discuss the theory and practice of Thoroughbase. My name is Derek Remish and today I am very excited to introduce a new publication of mine that I edited and translated in collaboration with the renowned Bach scholar Robin A. Lever. The publication is a two-volume series entitled Realizing Thoroughbase Chorales in the Circle of J.S. Bach. The aim of the series is to make historical documents from Bach Circle accessible to students, teachers, and scholars today. In this video, I will survey the historical background of the various sources and will provide an overview of the contents of the two volumes. Let's get started. The central question underlying the series is, how did J.S. Bach teach composition? We know already that his teaching involved the use of his own compositions like the Inventions and Symphonias, the Well-Tempered Clavier, and the Orgelbuchlein. We can certainly learn much by studying these works, but this doesn't get to the question of precisely how Bach taught composition. Luckily, there are two pieces of evidence that reveal more information. First, Bach once wrote a testimonial for a student of his named Friedrich Gottlieb Wild that attests that Wild, quote, has taken special instruction from me in the clavier, thorough bass, and the fundamental principles of composition that are derived from them." End quote. By the way, I'm omitting citations in this video since everything is cited in detail in the two volumes. This quote from Bach is immensely important because it proves conclusively that, at least around 1727, Bach's understanding of composition and compositional pedagogy relied on the keyboard and thorough bass. The second piece of evidence is an account by Bach's son, C.P.E. Bach, which states that, quote, his students had to learn, had to start by learning pure four-part thorough bass. Then he went with them to chorales. First he set the bass himself, and they had to invent the alto and tenor. Next he taught them to invent their own basses. He was particularly insistent on the writing out of the voices in thorough bass, end quote. Here, CPE confirms that his father's teaching relied on thorough bass, specifically emphasizing that thorough bass had to be written out in four parts. This is important. CPE also describes his father using chorales in a very specific way, where each of the outer voices were supplied, uh, were first supplied, presumably with thorough bass figures, and students had to write out two middle voices. Then students composed their own bass lines and inner voices. My two-volume series focuses on the first of these two tasks, the addition of two middle voices to a pre-existing outer voice framework. The composition of original basses is not addressed directly, but my hope is that a third volume might one day treat this topic. To summarize, Bach's compositional pedagogy involved thorough bass and chorales at the keyboard. Therefore, this series aims to help students today to develop these skills by using sources from Bach's circle. So just what are these sources, and how do they relate to one another? We'll begin by sketching them as a network, or, if you like, as a sort of circle. The first source is a brief list of thorough bass rules stemming from J.S. Bach. I will return to this list a little later. Next, there is an anonymous source called the Precepts and Principles, dating from around 1728. While the exact provenance of this source is not known, it seems to originate from Bach's teaching at the Thomasschule in Leipzig. This source contains fantastic thorough bass exercises that are included in Volume 1. Next, I would like to mention a treatise by Johann David Heinichen titled Der Generalbass in der Komposition, or Thorough Bass in Composition. This treatise is not included in the series, but it still plays an important linking role. This is because Bach acted as the publisher's agent, selling Heinichen's treatise out of his home in Leipzig, presumably on commission. While this doesn't guarantee that Bach endorsed Heinichen's work, it does show that Bach was willing to be publicly associated with it. Moreover, it also means Bach probably read it and thus may have been influenced by it. This seems likely since just like Bach, Heinichen also believes that thorough bass is the foundation of composition and compositional pedagogy, as seen directly in the title of his treatise. 
1732, only four years after Heinichen's treatise, David Kellner published the first edition of his treatise, Treuliche Unterricht im Generalbass, or True Instruction in Thoroughbass. In fact, Kellner's work is largely a digest of Heinichen's treatise. Whereas Heinichen's work is almost a thousand pages long, making it quite expensive, Kellner's is only about a hundred pages, which made it much more affordable and popular in his day. Though Kellner is essentially a derivative author, who mostly borrows from others, primarily Heineken, Kellner was nevertheless a very talented pedagogue who had a knack for presenting ideas very clearly and concisely. Volume 1 of my series presents the first English translation of Kellner's treatise, based on the second edition from 1737. We already saw how J.S. Bach used thorough bass and chorales in his teaching. C.P.E. Bach actually published a collection of 14 thorough bass chorales in 1787 titled The New Melodies for Some Chorales in the New Hamburg Chorale Book, or simply New Melodies for short. Robin Lever and I have discovered that C.P.E. endorsed the combined publication of Kellner's treatise with his New Melodies around 1788, hence the motivation behind their combined publication here. Finally, there is the so-called Sibley Chorale Book, named for the library at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York, where the source is currently held. This is undoubtedly the most important source in the series. Though the Sibley Chorale Book is anonymous, the title page attributes it to J.S. Bach. Moreover, Robin Lever has recently reassessed the source and has concluded convincingly that the, CP, that the Sibley Chorale book very likely originates from J.S. Bach's students active in Dresden around 1730 to 1740. Volume 2 presents a modern pedagogical edition of the complete Sibley Chorale book, that is, in modern notation, but with minimal editorial annotations to assist in the realization of inner voices. More on this and the other sources momentarily. Let's now take a look at the contents of the two volumes. Volume 1 opens with a very short introduction outlining the historical background of the sources. Then follows a thorough base primer for beginners by yours truly. Some may question why such a primer is necessary, since the goal of the series is to allow students today to learn directly from historical sources. This is a valid critique. The reason for including a primer, however, is that those readers with no prior experience with Thoroughbase may still find it difficult to interact with the original sources without some kind of mediation. Those readers who are already familiar with Thoroughbase can simply skip the primer or just use it as a quick review. Next follows J.S. Bach's brief list of rules, and then two sections taken from the anonymous Precepts and Principles. These are the principles of playing in four parts and the most common cadences, plus an appendix of suggested realizations. Then follows CPE's 14 new melodies with two appendices of realizations. Finally, Volume 1 closes with the translation of Kellner's treatise, making 156 pages in all. Volume 2 opens with the same introduction as found in Volume 1, followed by some remarks on the Sibley Chorale book. The vast majority of Volume 2 is the Sibley Chorale book itself, which includes an index of chorales and cross-references to settings of the same melody to facilitate comparison. Since the Sibley Chorale book is quite long, Volume 2 is 144 pages, or roughly the same length as Volume 1, even though it contains only one source. We'll now take a closer look at each of the sources. Here is an overview of the topics covered in my thorough base primer for beginners. I assume that the reader has only very basic familiarity with music notation and with the keyboard. The primer itself is 27 pages long and includes 37 brief musical examples. 
The first of the historical sources in Volume 1 is Bach's list of 15 brief rules about doubling, such as, quote, with the 7-5, one takes the 3, end quote. The source is actually in Anna Magdalena Bach's hand and is found at the end of her Notenbuch from 1725. While these rules are available in other modern editions, their direct connection to Bach and to Thoroughbase justify their inclusion in Volume 1 with an updated translation. Now we come to the principles of playing in four parts from the anonymous Precepts and Principles. On the left side we see the first page of the exercises. Note that these exercises do not involve chorale melodies. Rather, they are merely intended to teach the principles of Thoroughbase. Recall that, according to CPE, his father began by teaching Thoroughbase before proceeding to chorales. I have edited the exercises here to make them particularly appropriate for today's students. For instance, I have included a blank upper staff so that students can write out their realizations, as Bach apparently required his own students to do. All departures from the original source are outlined in this section's introduction, which includes some facsimiles of the original for comparison. Every exercise contains a reference to the page in Appendix 1 containing editorial solutions. For instance, on the right-hand side, we see some different ways of realizing an, an, an ascending 5-6 sequence, which is exercise number 3. Some editorial commentary follows after each solution. This commentary will be especially helpful for students using the series without the assistance of a teacher. The second section from this source, The Most Common Cadences, also includes editorial solutions and commentary. Next we come to CPE's New Melodies, which contain 14 thorough bass chorales in a very simple style just like those in the Sibley Chorale book, as we will see. As in the previous section, I have edited CPE's chorales to make them especially easy to use for today's students. For instance, all note stems face outward, which affords more space for written out middle voices. In some cases, I also transpose the chorales into easier keys, since, in my experience, the original keys were sometimes too difficult for beginners. Again, all such departures from the original are clearly marked. There follow two appendices of suggested solutions, as shown on the right-hand side. As before, the solutions contain detailed annotations to assist students who wish to use this series without the aid of a teacher. Volume 1 closes with the, transla with the translation of Kellner's treatise, which was first published in 1732 the 2,000 copies of which apparently sold out quite quickly. Interestingly, Telemann wrote the preface to the second edition in 1737, praising the work for its concise and reliable instruction. This is the reason I have chosen to translate the second edition and not the first. Telemann provides yet another connection to J.S. Bach's circle, since Telemann and Bach were once close friends. Telemann was even CPE Bach's godfather. One imagines that these three occasionally discussed compositional matters, such that Telemann may have recommended Kellner's treatise to J.S. Bach or to CPE as a reliable introduction to Thoroughbase for beginners. There followed at least 10 more editions of Kellner's treatise throughout the 18th century, if each of these had only a thousand copies, then there were well over 10,000 copies of Kellner's work circulating in Europe in the 18th century, making it perhaps the best-selling thoroughbase treatise of all time. This alone is reason enough to justify an English translation of Kellner's work. As noted already, Kellner borrows heavily from Heinrichen's treatise, which J.S. Bach acted as agent for, selling it out of his home. 
Moreover, new evidence brought forth by Robin Lever and me reveals that CPE endorsed the combined publication of his new melodies with the seventh edition of Kellner's treatise around 1788. The publisher of this combined publication wrote in the preface that, quote, it is the opinion of experts that chorales represent the best practice pieces for, the be for beginners of thorough bass, end quote. The publisher's mention of experts must be a reference to CPE Bach, meaning CPE Bach knew of and endorsed Kellner's treatise, just as Telemann did. The implication is that, in associating Kellner's treatise with the thorough bass chorales in the new melodies, CPE Bach may have been preserving aspects of his father's teaching. After all, CPE said he never had any other teacher than his father. And since Kellner is primarily a digest of Heineken, it seems J.S. Bach, Telemann, and CPE all subscribed to a similar theoretical outlook that held thorough bass and chorales to be the foundation of compositional training. Finally, we come to the anonymous Sibley Chorale book, a modern edition of which comprises the bulk of Volume 2. As noted already, Robin Lever recently attributed the Sibley Chorale book to J.S. Bach's Circle of Pupils active in Dresden around 1730 to 1740. The source itself contains 227 thorough bass chorales, meaning the chorale is in the top voice with a figured bass with a figured bass line below it, just as in CPE's 14 melodies, uh, new melodies. The player had to add the middle voices, as indicated by the title, which says, quote, Sebastian Bach's four-part chorale book. That is, the two given outer voices should be supplemented by two middle voices. The most important ramification of the Sibley Chorale book is that the chorales are in the simple chorale buch style and are intended for improvised or written out realization at the keyboard using thorough bass. Note that the chorales are not in the same, not in the more complex style of Bach's ornamented four-part vocal chorale gesänge. The chorale gesänge, which originate from Bach's cantatas and passions, have played a central role in attempts to imitate Bach's teachings for centuries. But the Sibley Chorale book, and indeed a whole host of similar sources from Bach's circle that have been newly rediscovered, are beginning to alter this time-honored tradition. To summarize, Bach's teaching appears to have involved a much simpler style than previously assumed, one involving thorough bass at the keyboard, not the chorale gesänge. This is a point I emphasize in my forthcoming dissertation. Another point I discuss in my dissertation is that Bach's teaching appears to have involved the composition of multiple figured bass lines below each chorale melody. There are literally dozens of multiple bass sources stemming from Bach's circle that have surfaced in recent years. Multiple bass chorale harmonization thus represents an exciting new area of Bach research and of historical pedagogy. But before attempting to compose multiple bass lines, Bach students had to first master thorough bass and the addition of two middle voices to a given outer voice chorale framework. My hope is that this publication may provide practical exercises in this regard that will be useful to students and teachers alike. I thank you very much for your attention and I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to purchase a copy of the series, it is available for order at wayneleopold.com. There are also free materials for learning thorough base that are available on my website, derekremish.com. There you can also find information about composition and theory lessons, which I offer via Skype. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time at Go Figure.